of angels sing glory to the newborn king peace on earth and mercy my own God in sin has reconciled joyful ye nations rise join the triumph of the skies with angelic hosts proclaim Christ is born in Bethlehem Hark the herald angels sing glory to the newborn King Christ by highest and adored Christ the everlasting Lord Made in time Behold in kind Offspring I'll do the Korean too. What's up, Shipshio? Bangapsinida. Now, welcome. Good evening. Let's do it again. Good evening. Come on now. It's Christmas Eve. How are you doing? Fantastic. All right. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Asher. Welcome to Redeemer International Community Church. We are glad that you are here with us tonight to celebrate Christmas Eve, to celebrate the arrival of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I realize that many of us are probably far from home, maybe far from our families as well. And so we thank you for coming out tonight. Some of you regulars, some of you guests, thank you for being here tonight to join us in worship this evening. As we get started, let's just take a moment and just welcome each other tonight. We uh, also want to ask you if you could to just kind of squeeze in a little bit closer to each other, just make sure there's some room as people trickle in. Traffic's crazy outside. So let's welcome each other, shake hands, get to know some people, and kind of squeeze in tighter with each other. All right? There we go. Also, our kids that are singing and presenting scripture tonight, if you can come on up to... Robert, do we need to pull stuff back for you? Do we need to pull stuff back? Do we need to pull stuff back, I'm asking? 
All right. All right. Welcome. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Tonight, tonight as we continue in worship, we are going to have um, we're going to have our kids uh, sing a song. Our older ones are going to sing for us, and then we have our younger ones that are going to quote some scripture for us this evening. So, turn it over to the little ones. Also, our, our preschooler is going to be sharing some scripture with us. And now the preschooler. longing. 
right? It's, it's setting our minds and our hearts and our thoughts upon the coming of Jesus Christ. Now, obviously, when we think about Advent, we think about the coming of Christ, our minds kind of immediately go back to the manger, uh, to Bethlehem some 2,000 plus years ago as Jesus was born as a, as a baby laid in a manger in swaddling cloths. But, but even more so, we want our minds to turn towards the future, towards the fact that Christ is coming again. And He has promised to return and to come for those who are His and to usher us into the eternal presence of our Father. And so during the Advent season, each week of Advent, we've been lighting candles. And we light the candles as a reminder that Christ is the light of the world. He's, he's come into the world to shine into the darkness of our sin, to shine into the darkness of our hearts, to awaken us to who He is and to lead us into everlasting life through faith and repentance and trust in Him. And so each week we've lit a candle, and the candle is a reminder that Christ is the light who is coming to the world, and the light who is coming ultimately into the world. So this morning we're going to light this morning. This evening, this is where I know what time it is. This evening we're going to light all four candles. Go ahead. And we're going to read from Luke chapter 1, verses, uh, Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. It says, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to, birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you this evening, and we praise you and thank you for your grace, your mercy, your goodness, and your kindness. Lord, we thank you that at this time of year, we as your people can turn our attention specifically to consider, to contemplate the coming of Christ, to experience, Lord, as, mo as, as much as we can, the anticipation and the longing that filled your people so long ago as they waited for the Messiah to come. And even more so now, Father, we can experience that same longing as we look forward to the second coming of Christ. That Jesus hasn't left us forever, but Jesus has left us for a time, promised as he was ascending into heaven that he would return again for his people. And so, Father, tonight as we worship Christ, as we sing songs of praise, as we read your word, and as we hear your word proclaimed tonight, Father, we pray that you would be glorified in the praise and the worship of your people. We pray that as Christ is exalted in our midst, Father God, that you would be glorified and that we, your people, would be encouraged, that we would be challenged, that we would be sustained through your word and through worship. Father, that you ultimately would be glorified in the praise of your people. I want to thank you for everybody who's come out tonight, Lord. Some of us are far from home. We are far from family, Lord, but we are united together and our faith and our trust in our dependence upon Jesus Christ. And we thank you for that. In Christ's name, amen. Let's stand together. Yeah. 
Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14, it reads, In the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day, in the city of David, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was, the angel, uh, suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. The word of the Lord. Stand with us again. Oh, come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, Oh, 
Oh, come, let us adore. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Luke chapter 2, verse 15 through 20. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, ponder pondering them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. Amen. You can be seated. All right. Well, good evening again. I realized probably I did probably a couple of things I should have done that I didn't do earlier. One is introduce myself. Um, my name is Dan, and I'm one of the pastors here at Redeemer. Um, I haven't preached in a while, so there's a good chance many of you, even if you're not a guest, have forgotten who I am. So, hi, I'm Dan. Nice to meet you. Uh, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter four tonight. So, if you do have a Bible with you, I want you to invite you just to turn to Luke chapter four. Um, maybe you don't have a, a Bible, you have a phone or a tablet or, or something of, of that nature. But we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 4, and, and just briefly tonight, kind of uh, looking at Luke chapter 4, 22 through 30. Uh, the, the last part of uh, the text that we've really been looking at over the past four weeks. Uh, so here, uh, through the Advent season, the past four weeks, we've been going through Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 21. And... Uh, Everybody kind of was complaining about how small of a portion of Scripture they got, and that's because I saved the biggest portion for myself, um, so I was allowed to do that. Sorry about that, but uh, to him who decides, go the spoils. So we're going to be looking at 22 through 30. Now, most of you probably don't know me beyond my time in Korea here. I've been in Korea for four years, and, and I would venture to say the majority of you know me basically over the past four years, some of you less than that. Uh, but I can assure you that um, I was not always this bastion of righteousness that you see standing before you. Um, in fact, there was a time when being a pastor or a missionary uh, probably was the, the furthest thing you could ever imagine happening to me or, or me doing. In fact, if you knew me, basically any time from maybe birth to let's say 20 years old, and somebody said to you, oh, that Dan, he's going to be a pastor one day when he grows up, they would have laughed. I would have laughed. I would have thought it was asinine and crazy, especially considering the trajectory that my life was on. And it's kind of interesting, when I did give my life to Christ, and when things began to change rather radically, some of the people I grew up with um, had kind of diverse reactions to my conversion. All right? Maybe some that were skeptical, maybe some that were just kind of waiting to see me go back to my old ways, maybe some that were overjoyed at what had happened in my life. But the, the fact of the matter is I can guarantee that probably all of them were surprised. It's interesting because if you look at this text, and as we have been looking at this text, Jesus is in his hometown. You know, and it's unique. He's, he's in his hometown. He's begun his public ministry, and he's going back there to preach now in the synagogue. And these are people who watched little Jesus grow up, right? Watch little Jesus run around in the streets, watch little baby Jesus uh, go to work with his dad, work with a hammer and, and nails and, and do carpentry. Now, we don't believe like things in the infancy of uh, of Jesus Christ here, those Gnostic Gospels where Jesus made clay figurines come to life, although that would be kind of rad, I'm going to be honest with you. But uh, he was a child. We don't often think about that, but Jesus was a little child that ran around and did childish things, and he's in his hometown with people who watched him do this stuff. And so tonight we're going to consider their reaction to Jesus. Here's Jesus teaching in the synagogue, and, and we're going to look at their reaction. And I think as we look at the reaction of Jesus' hometown crowd, 
to his teaching. I, I think we are invariably brought to a place where, where we have to consider our own reaction to Jesus. Because the truth of the matter is, as we read these words and as we hear Jesus speak, we cannot separate ourselves as far as we might want to from the people who were originally listening to him. Because as we read these words, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God is speaking to us. And we too are brought to a place where we need to consider how are we going to respond or how have we responded to the claims of Jesus. So let's look at Luke chapter 4, verses 22 through 30. And he and all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, doubtless you will quote me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, truly, I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. This is the word of the Lord. May he be glorified at the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you this evening. We thank you for this time, not only to sing praises to your name, not only to be reminded of the, the season that we are celebrating, but also, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come and to spend some time in your word. And we pray that as we do, Father, that you would speak to us, that you would instruct us, that you would teach us, that you would give us wisdom and understanding considering your truth. And that, Lord, that, that at this time of year, we might be able to, to see through and kind of sift through the surface level reality of things that we might be able to delve down to the truth that the Messiah has come, that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And so, Lord, I pray that you give us wisdom as we look at your text tonight, that you would help us to hear and to understand, we pray in Christ's name. As, amen. Thank you, Asher. I take him everywhere with me. He's my amen guy. Uh, that was Calvin that said amen. I apologize. I got two amen guys. That's cool. Everybody should have two amen guys. Now, like I said, for the past four weeks, we've been looking at this one text, Luke 16 through 21. And, and it's a text where Jesus is in his hometown synagogue preaching and teaching. Now, uh, it was custom for Jesus to go into the synagogue and teach. Luke tells us that in, in verse 16 of this chapter. And Jesus comes in at a time where uh, a guest preacher would be invited to teach and they would have the freedom to choose where they would want to read from or where they would want to teach from. Now, Jesus deliberately chooses Isaiah chapter 61, as we have already seen. Matthew talked about that last week. And Isaiah 61 is a passage that is full of promises from God, specifically messianic promises, promises of a future hope, a future deliverance, a future freedom that will come to God's people. And so Jesus reads this text and he begins to preach on this text. Now, his sermon, although it was more than what is recorded in Luke, culminates in the declaration that Jesus makes in verse 21. So if you look at verse 21, Jesus says, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Right? Now, this is no small declaration. Right? This declaration is nothing short of amazing, because what Jesus is saying is he is saying that the promises of God the promises that the people have been waiting centuries upon centuries to be fulfilled have now finally found their fulfillment in this man that is sitting in front of them. Jesus is declaring that he himself is the fulfillment of the promises of God. Well, as you can probably imagine, the, the crowd reacts to this declaration right, with a, a certain sense of astonishment as probably we would, too, if we were sitting there. And so as we look at verse 22, we read, All spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. If we look at a parallel passage in Mark chapter 6, Mark writes that the people were astonished at what Jesus said. That is, they were struck with amazement at the preaching and the teaching of Jesus. 
Here in Luke, that astonishment is, is expressed in two phrases. Uh, the first being that all spoke well of him, and the second being that they marveled at the gracious words that were coming out of his mouth. Now, to say that the crowd spoke well of him, or literally testified concerning him, is to say that as Jesus spoke, they recognized that Jesus had skill as an orator. He had skill as a speaker. He was skillful in the word of God. Now, we shouldn't be surprised at this because the only glimpse we get of Jesus prior to the beginning of his earthly ministry is when he gets lost at the temple at 12 years old, right? Now, he doesn't get lost like maybe you got lost before, like at Walmart or at some other place at Home Plus. I don't know, maybe you got lost at Home Plus one time. But if you get lost at Home Plus at this age, that's just embarrassing. Like, you are old enough to not get lost at Home Plus. When I was a kid, I got lost. Anybody ever got lost at a grocery store, like separated from mom and dad? Uh, me. Okay. <laughs> the, the interactive part of, the, of this whole thing is going to stop now. <laughs> I got lost once. It's a frightening feeling, right? When you're, you're like on an aisle looking at like the cookies and the cakes and thinking about what you want to buy and you turn around, mom and dad are gone, right? But Jesus didn't do that. Jesus knew exactly where he was supposed to be. He parked himself in the temple and he starts talking to the guys running the show, right? Mary and Joseph, they pack up, they leave him halfway home. They realize, oh, dang it, we forgot our kid. Yeah, the Holy Spirit given kid. We forgot him. Might want to go back and get him. God might get angry at that. They go back where they find him. They find him conversing with the, with the people in the temple. And they are marveling at his understanding of the word. Right? And here it's no different. As, as Jesus is speaking to the crowd, the crowd is, they're struck by his teaching. Not only struck by his teaching, but they're struck with the way I think his, his teaching accords with the written word. Right? Jesus isn't a blatant heretic. Right? He's not running around preaching some false doctrine, deviating from the written word of God. Yet he's, he's clearly expounding and exegeting the word of God. And so they, they testify well concerning him. They speak well of him. They're like, man, this guy's a good speaker. He's a good preacher. He's doing a great, much like you guys do it for me week after week, right? But Dan, is, he's a good preacher. He's a great job, doing well. I hope, I hope that's the conversations that I hear in the back, the murmuring that takes place could be mistaken, right? But they speak well of him. And not only do they speak well of him, but Luke says that they marvel at his teachings, right? Again, that word could be translated, they're amazed at his <clears throat> his teachings. Again, if we look at parallel passages like Mark chapter 6, he says that they were astonished at his teaching. And, and Matthew, actually, in chapter 7, verses 28 through 29, records the same thing, because marveling or being astonished at the teaching of Jesus actually is a regular occurrence for Christ. Right in Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 through 29, we come to the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And in Matthew 28, 20, uh, 7, 28 through 29, Matthew says, And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Right? So as Jesus is speaking, not only are they thinking, man, this dude is a good speaker, but they're also looking at Jesus and going, this is unlike anything we've really heard before. Like we're accustomed to the scribes and the Pharisees standing up and teaching and saying things, but this guy, he is teaching in a different way. He is teaching in a unique way. There's a certain authority that's coming through in his communication. There's a certain uniqueness that's, that's overtaking us here. And so they marvel at his teaching. I can only imagine what it would have been like you know, to sit in that crowd and to see Jesus. Not looking anything like just walking out of a GQ catalog, right? But sitting there and teaching. And I think we too would probably be struck by the uniqueness of his teaching. I think we too would probably marvel and be astonished at the words that were coming out of Jesus Christ. It was clear to those who heard him speak that day. They heard teaching unlike any before, and in response, they marveled at the words of Jesus. Unfortunately, this wonder, this marveling, this good report is all too quickly overcome by skepticism, doubt, and ultimately unbelief. Now, Luke summarizes this. He summarizes this skepticism, this doubt, and this unbelief in a single question that he records in verse 22. At the end of verse 22, we read, And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? So as Jesus is, is preaching and teaching, and as they're marveling, and as they're being astonished at his words, this, this creeping question comes up, and they say, Wait a second. This is Joe's kid, isn't it? 
Now, we might not think that there's too much written into this question, but again, if we look at a parallel passage in Mark, we find that this is not the only question that was asked that day. In fact, if we go back to Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, we read this. Where did this man get these things? What is this wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And again, in Matthew, he records almost exactly word for word what Mark records, but he adds this in Matthew 13, verse 56. Where did this man get all these things? Right, so as Jesus is standing and teaching him, and as he reaches this grand crescendo that I am the fulfillment of the promises of God, the people can't seem to shake the fact that we know you, Jesus. We know you're Joseph's son. We know you're Mary's son. We know you're a carpenter. We saw you run around on the streets. We know your brothers and sisters. In fact, there's one over there. There's another one over there, and your sisters are outside. This isn't some humble question about the lineage of Jesus Christ, but rather this is a question packed with doubt and skepticism. How can you, Jesus, little carpenter Jesus, claim to be the fulfillment of God's promises? How can you be so arrogant? How can you be so mighty? How can you take such claims upon yourself? We know you, Jesus. Don't try to pull one over on us, buddy. And Luke condenses all that into a question. Now, understanding that this question is not some simple question, but rather is the fruit of doubt, skepticism, and unbelief, makes the strong rebuke of Jesus Christ all the clearer. If the people were certainly trying, or were, if the people were simply trying to remember which house it was that Jesus grew up in, then the words of Jesus would seem harsh and totally out of place. But if we understand that the people were expressing their unbelief in the claims of Jesus, then his harsh rebuke makes perfect sense. And so what Jesus does in verses 23 through the close of this section is he exposes their unbelief. He also condemns it and clearly communicates the consequences of their unbelief. So in verses 23 through 24, Jesus exposes their unbelief. So in verse 23, Jesus says, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself or yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. In these words, Jesus speaks, he gets to the heart, the root of their unbelief. You see, the crowds don't believe the words of Jesus. Jesus here identifies himself as a prophet. He says, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. And what is a prophet? A prophet is one who proclaims the word of God. It's one who speaks God's word. He speaks truth. And what the crowd is saying is, your word is not sufficient. Your word is not enough. If you want us to believe, if you want us to really lay, lay our, 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 our hopes and our stakes on the claims that you're making, then you better put up or shut up. We heard you did some crazy things across the lake. We heard that over in Capernaum, you're making blind people see, and you're making deaf people hear, and you're making lame people walk. But now you're here in your hometown, and you haven't done anything. So if you want us to believe you, if you want us to trust you, Jesus, then you better act. You better do something. You better prove. Do some miracles and signs. And then maybe, just maybe, we'll believe you. But as Matthew preached last week, and you're not Matthew, he's somewhere. There you are. Matthew preached last week and made abundantly clear faith does not come through miracles. Faith does not come through seeing miracles. Faith comes through hearing. Romans 10, 9. Faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Jesus is a prophet. He speaks truth. And here the hometown crowd says, no, your word. Your word, Jesus, is not good enough. And so Jesus quotes this proverb because he knows what's going on in their minds. He knows what's rolling around in their hearts. You want a fireworks show. You want signs and wonders. And isn't that something that plagues Jesus over the life of his ministry? Crowds gather around him simply for signs and wonders, caring nothing of what he says. And yet the gospel... The gospel is not a miracle. The gospel is a message. It's a proclamation. Repent and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus exposes their unbelief with this proverb. And then reminding them of two stories from the Old Testament, he exposes the consequences and the condemnation 
for their unbelief. Now keep in mind, Jesus is in a synagogue. He's hanging out with a bunch of Jews and he's teaching them and they know the Old Testament well. And so he dips back into Israel's history to a pretty dark place in Israel's history to remind these people of the consequences and the condemnation for unbelief. And so he says in verse 25, but in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months and a great famine came over all the land and Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. Now, just in case you're a little off on your geography, Sidon falls outside the realms of Israel, outside the boundaries of God's chosen people. These are Gentiles. These are Hagoyim, the peoples, the ones that the Jews were not to have any dealings with, the ones that the Jews looked down upon, the ones that they criticized and, and condemned. And Jesus says, hey, remember in the times of Elijah how faithless Israel was and the blessings and the promises of God came not to faithless Israel, but the blessings and the promises of God went to a Gentile widow. And if that wasn't enough, he says, what about Elisha? What about the days of Elisha? There were many lepers. Israel probably full of lepers and none of them healed. Who was healed? Naaman, the Syrian. And who is Naaman? Naaman is a general who probably 20 minutes before he showed up at Elisha's door to get healed was raiding a town in Israel, laying siege to God's people. And here Naaman the Syrian comes and he is healed. And here's the thing. The people listening to Jesus, they get the point. They understand what he's saying here. They, they understand who they are in this little story that Jesus is spinning. They understand that they are faithless Israel, that they are like their ancestors of old who ignore the word of the prophets and they watch as the blessings and the promises and the goodness and the graciousness of God goes to other people because of their faithlessness. How do we know they get the point? Because guess what? They're not marveling and wondering anymore about Jesus. They're trying to kill him. Been a pretty quick change here because when we get to verse 28, when they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. I mean, I, I, I don't want to be too comical here, but I mean, honestly, can you imagine that scene? It's like Jesus finishes and like this. That was awesome. Jesus nailed it. Great sermon. What did you think? That was odd. That was great. One of the best we've heard. Wonderful job, Jesus. It's amazing. What, wait, what did you just say? Come again? Wahua? No, let's kill this dude. Let's, yeah, let's kill him. I've changed my mind about the whole wondering and amazement thing. I want him dead. And so they take Jesus out to the brow of a hill with the intent of throwing him off and killing him. In a miraculous way, Christ walks through the midst of them. Why? Because his time has not come. So I think they got the point. They understood Jesus' rebuke and condemnation. My word, my declaration is not sufficient for you. You don't believe my word. But let me remind you, brothers, of the consequences of unbelief. Let me remind you again that if you don't believe in the word of God, you will watch as his gracious promises of salvation go past you and on to others who will believe the word of God. And they understand well the condemnation of Jesus Christ. Their faithlessness has been exposed. And their faithlessness has been judged. And I ask you, will it be any different for us? We have heard Jesus speak. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The Word of God is timeless. And the Word of God speaks just as loudly and clearly today as it did those centuries before. And we, like those who sat and heard Jesus speak centuries before us, we too are brought to a point of decision. Jesus makes ridiculous claims. And He leaves no gray area for us to sink into. He claims to be Messiah. He claims to be the fulfillment of God's promises. He claims to be the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through Him. 
Jesus has not left the door open for us to say he's a good moral teacher or he's a good moral example or he's a super nice guy. Every door has been shut. He is either Messiah or he is not. C.S. Lewis once famously said that Jesus is either liar, lunatic, or Lord. And he has left us no other option. He can't be a good teacher because a good teacher wouldn't lie. And Jesus made some crazy claims. So he's either liar, lunatic, or he is Lord. And we are brought to a place of decision. Christ is Messiah or he is nothing. You know, it's interesting, I think, and and maybe you don't, but I, I think it's interesting here that that being impressed with Jesus is not enough. Right? The, crowds, the crowds, everywhere he goes, they're impressed by him. He, he's, 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 a, he's a great teacher. He's, he's, a, he's a great speaker. And there's, a, there's an inherent authority that comes out. And crowds are impressed by him. But being impressed by Jesus, being enamored with Jesus, being amazed by Jesus is not enough. I read an article uh, on, online today, and it was an article between uh, uh, a writer for the New York Times and a, a, a pastor named Timothy Keller in, in New York City. And if you don't know who Tim Keller is, then I would encourage you to Google his name. Not now while I'm, I'm talking, but afterwards. Google his name and buy every book that he has written and read those books. And this New York Times author is talking to Tim Keller about and basically the title of his pastor, Am I a Christian? And he starts off the interview by saying, you know, I have great respect for Christians. I have great respect for Jesus. I love his teachings. I'm very impressed by his teachings. But being impressed by Jesus' teachings, being enamored with Christ, is not enough. It's not sufficient. Jesus demands repentance and faith. Jesus demands that we repent of our sins and we place our faith and trust in him as Messiah, as the fulfillment of of God's promises as the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through Jesus Christ. Jesus is not some wonderful buffet where we are free to pick and choose what we want. And this is a country that nails buffets. I don't know how long you've been in Korea, but Korea does a buffet right. We come from the southern United States. And I don't know if anybody else from the southern United States here, but buffets to us is like western sizzling. Where it's basically like somebody went out back out a trash can and threw it across the table and said, have at it, y'all. <laughs> Korea knows how to do buffets. And we love buffets. Why? Because you get whatever you want at a buffet. There's the fish station. There's the steak station. There's the dessert station. And nobody says you can't go to dessert first. Isn't that brilliant? That's where I go every time. I kid you not. I go to the salad and dessert, and I just walk back to my table. And you can look at me. You can stare at me all you want to. I'm going to eat dessert the whole entire time. Like, dessert is a constant present in every part of my meal. And we love buffets because we can just take what we want, and we can leave what we don't. Jesus is not some grand buffet. He's not some great teacher that we come to and we go, you know what? I like your moral aspects. I like your whole treat others as you want to be treated. But the whole stuff about you being a Messiah and the exclusivity of your claims that I must repent and believe in you and you alone, I'm not cool with. And Jesus will look at you, unfortunately, on the day of judgment, like Matthew 7, 21, and he will say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, for I never knew you. You might have been impressed with my teaching. You might have thought I was a cool guy, a great moral teacher, but you missed the point. I demanded that you repent and you believe the gospel. And so I ask you, brothers and sisters here tonight, How have you responded to Jesus? Because there's only one response that is sufficient, and that is knees bowed, humbly coming to him and confessing that he is the fulfillment of God's promises. He is the Messiah, and we repent of our sins, and we place our faith and our trust and our hope in Christ and in Christ alone. And in that, we are saved. For to deny Christ, To fail to believe Christ, to fail to trust Christ, is to watch as the gracious promises of salvation that God has brought through Jesus Christ pass to others, and we reap the death of our sin that is rightfully ours. He is either Messiah or he is nothing. So my prayer is that all of us in here would hear the words of Christ, would believe 
in Jesus Christ, repent of our sins and trust Him as Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we praise you and thank you for your word. We praise you and thank you for Christ. We praise you and thank you that you sent him not to be a conquering king riding a horse, brandishing a sword, but you sent him to be a suffering servant. You sent him, Lord, to go to the cross. Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 53 that all we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, but you, Father, you have caused the iniquity of us all to be laid on him. And so, Father, as we celebrate Christmas, as we celebrate Advent, and we do so remembering that Jesus came to die. He came to give his life as a ransom for many. And Father, I pray that everyone in here can say with assurance that they have repented of their sins and are trusting in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior because Christ will, re will be received as none less. Father, let us not make the mistake of those who centuries before us heard Jesus speak and failed to believe. Father, in your grace and your mercy, awaken faith in our hearts. Awaken trust in our hearts. Bring us to repentance, we pray. In Christ's name, amen.